It's hard to believe in anything, let alone yourself. And I think people are craving a sense of meaning and purpose and values. And uh, so there's sort of a return. I'd like to welcome to the show, John Irwin. How you doing, John? I'm good, man. You've already had my brother on, so set the bar low. You know, you've had the, you've had the suave, friendly brother on. I'm the neurotic, exactly. you know, like mad scientist brother. I think he calls me. Anyway, so so, uh, but thanks for having me on, man. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, man. yeah. I've had Andy. I had Andy on when you guys were promoting uh, American Underdog, which I love that film. And after I watched that Thank film, you. I went back and I just went through your catalog because I was so impressed with how that film was put together story wise. I was like, man, there's something here. And then I went, I, and then I'd heard of your other films I hadn't seen, you know, uh, I still believe. And uh, can you imagine and all those kind of films. And my wife and I just sat there and binged them all, man. It's, you guys are doing oh, some really, great. yeah, you guys are doing some really, that. yeah, I'm seriously, you guys are doing some really good stuff. So when your new film, Jesus revolution came up, I was like, Oh, I gotta have, I gotta have John on, you know, if I had the one, I gotta have the other one on. And then you the gotta, next time yeah. I'll have both of you on and I'll be we'll just have like both. A- we'll do it together. Right now we're dividing and conquering. You know, we do so much grassroots uh, marketing, uh, but I'm glad you enjoy the films. I mean, ultimately it's, it's a privilege. I mean, it's a privilege to entertain people. Like it's, oh. I, I just think that the business of entertainment is so hard and uh, you know, sometimes sucks on a certain level because it's so hyper competitive. You know, sometimes it's easy to lose sight of just how cool it is to get <laughs> yes. to do what we do, you know, and anytime that you can have, you can sort of see something in your mind or feel it deeply in your soul, write it on a piece of paper. And then hundreds of people come around you to make that thing real. And you're, you're sitting there with an audience and they're, 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 they're moved by it and they're watching it as if it were real. It's like magic. It's like dreaming while awake. And it's a, it is a privilege to do this. And uh, I'm grateful for the audience to supporting the work enough to, to let us uh, do this for a living. I mean, this is a job that you should like work another job, like behind a desk for years and years and years, save up some money and just blow it all getting to do this. So the fact that we get <laughs> paid at all for this is really, really cool. It's a, it's a miracle that anything gets made. It's a miracle that anything gets made. And that isn't mm-hmm. it fascinating that as, as, as an artist, we are the artist that spends the least amount of time doing the art which is the days on set mm-hmm. are so few and far between. It's mostly revving up to get the damn thing made, writing yeah. it, getting it produced, get, trying to raise money, do all that stuff. Then you spend, if you're lucky, 30 to 60 days, if you're lucky. Uh, I, would, <laughs> <laughs> I was yeah, talking have- to, yeah, I was, I, I'm not, I'm not trying to name stuff. I was talking to, but having said that, now I'm going to, I uh, had, uh, talking to Mel Gibson about his movie Hacksaw Ridge, a very good movie. Oh, and, uh, such a good movie. You know, it's the director's movie. question. Like, I was like, how many days did you have to shoot it? And he was like, man, you know, they didn't quite have their money together. I had to shoot that movie in 58 days shooting. I'm like, <laughs> I would shoot two movies now. And he's like, well, on Braveheart, we had 85. I'm like, I would shoot three movies. So yeah, I've, I've never had more than 30 days to shoot a movie. And, you know? and, uh, and and there's there's magic to that though. I think Orson yeah, Welles says the absence of the absence of limitation is the death of creativity. Like you, there's magic to being in a corner, backed into a corner, feeling panicked, you know, and and uh, and not being able to second guess your instincts. But but yeah, we, you're right. You 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 prep for months. You shoot for just this small time, you know, and uh, it's like summer camp, and then it's over, and then you and you edit it for months, and then you market it for months, and so you're right. The, actual making of the theme of the thing and the overall process is very, very short. And uh, if you want to really get crazy, if you remember uh, John Woo uh, on the killer, he had 170 days. Oh, come on. <laughs> what do you do? What, the, what do you, you do? Do you show up you and make, do one shot and you're like, okay, there's a good day. Good you day more, you basically shoot those insane action sequences until your heart's content. Like that's how he was able to make the killer yeah. and hard boiled. They had like 140, 180 day. Shoot. That's insane, man. That's that's sick. insane. Sick. That's sick. Um, you mad? Yeah, I maybe. So I have no idea. I don't. I don't even know. I don't know. I would. I wouldn't know what to do. I would have no clue how to even show up for a day's work. With We're gonna shoot a half a page schedule. today, guys. We're gonna shoot half. Yeah, a page. not quarter even. Page. Yeah, quarter page. Like, quarter yeah. page today. We shoot this line. Gonna get it eighteen different All ways, day. and we're done. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. it's uh. Uh, you know what's funny though is is for the independent filmmakers out there. I think for me, I, when we used to do music videos, you know, our career started in sports television, 
lied about our age, lied about my age, so we come a cameraman and uh, somebody got sick randomly. And then my dad bought us a camera, we started making stuff, and it's like that Malcolm Gladwell ten thousand hour rule uh, 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 kicked in. Just you know, I I really think what we do is, to your point, much more of a business than it is an art form. It's the symphony of art, and it's also much more of a craft than it is an art form. And it's it, it combines a lot of art, but a craft is something you sort of like just get better and better at every day, you know, in, mm -hmm. in sort of an iterative process it's sort of like you against you and it's a quest to just improve and and slowly but surely um seek to master your craft uh but you know way back in the day we would make um all kinds of music videos that was sort of our our grind and uh we would do a bunch of them like four or five a month and uh yeah. it was for after like, napster. for like 500 bucks like 500 bucks thousand well bucks. that's the thing it, well no what happened is it was after napster and so andy and i came into nashville and the whole industry was like, there are no more $300,000 music videos. What are we going to do? Well, and we were like, someone's going to pay us $15,000 to do a music video. Let's do all of them, you know? And so we just, uh, we just, you know, and, and so we, but it was this process. But what, what I realized is whenever we were on the random occasion that we had all the money in the time in the world and there were, you know, it just becomes decisions by committee and there were 12 execs there and all that stuff. Oh. There was a magic lost whenever, like the way we would do it is like Andy would prep a music video and I, I, so I would show up to his set and I hadn't even heard the song and then he would show up to my set and he had, and then we would just sort of leapfrog. And, uh, there was just always a magic when we never quite had enough and, uh, time or money. And there's something to the strain of having to solve problems creatively in an environment that's full of pressure that you can't second guess your instincts it's terrible for your health and you know mental <laughs> sanity but it really is good for the work and so i'm a huge fan of of um even like on the on the movie that you mentioned american underdog that went from a 46 day schedule pre-covid to a 30 day schedule post-covid because we had to cut a third of the budget out to keep it greenlit and i don't think that there that the other movie would have been better and a lot of a lot of the things that we came up with um, like using the real footage of the game, you know, which Andy yeah. and, and editorial really did well. We couldn't choreograph near as much stuff. So we choreographed what we could exactly as it happened in the real game. And then that way we could use the actual game footage. But and so a lot, there was a lot of articles and a lot of people saying that was a great artistic choice. And I'm like, that wasn't an artistic choice. That was a production limitation, you know? And uh, so I think you just find great ideas when you're constrained. Right, it's like you know, Jaws is the, the classic example of that. Right. Yeah, the, the shark doesn't work. Right. Okay, I guess we're gonna. So don't show it. Yeah, you know? we're not gonna show the shark as much. Uh, and it, it kind of worked out for that. That I forgot the guy's name. That one did well. Me. I don't even know that guy's name. Did he do anything else after? Now that one, that was a fifty-day shooting schedule. <laughs> Jaws was. They went yeah. hundred and fifty days. They went. But, but what's not his fault? Hundred days. Can you imagine? And can you imagine? That's his first big. Like he did Sugar Hairline Express. He did Duel. We're talking about Steven Spielberg, yeah. everybody. Uh, if you don't know, and <laughs> you then know. and then you and this is his first kind of big studio based on a best-selling yeah. book. And he's like, "I'm never going to work again. I'm never yeah. going to work again." He's like, he's "Yeah, he worst. thought he was going to get fired every day." And, the, and but, to his credit, water is horrible. Anytime you introduce oh. water in any <laughs> substantive way to um to to our industry. You well, grind nature to a in general, halt and nothing nature works. in general, nature in general, but water has water a specific, specifically because you got rain you know, and then just, you got cold. You got yeah. the, the water. You can't move. Everything just and it doesn't doesn't do what it wants. Even it doesn't do what you there, want it to do. It doesn't. Boy, act. does it look good. Boy, <laughs> does it look good. I think uh, in in this movie that we just did, Jesus Revolution. There's a whole sequence in the rain and yeah. uh, and and there's also some underwater dive tank work and uh, yeah. For this sort of dream sequence and and uh i remember talking to a keys the cinematographer and i'm like yeah i think we do the sequence in you know a couple hours or whatever this conversation in the rain he was like mm. six hours later uh i was like you were totally right a keys and uh but you know we do have this thing that we say uh pain is temporary film is forever you know and uh, i do believe in yep. that like go for difficult it, it, go for go for difficult uh no question and uh yeah, because it's just better
So, John, I mean, we just kind of ran off because because a lot of people don't know who you who you and Andy we did. are. So we we went on a tangent. We just we just went because yeah, we just we just went off the on the entire a audience probably. <laughs> so you know? so tell me tell me how you and your brother got you, you said you got into the business by music videos yeah uh, but your your first kind of if i'm not mistaken your first narrative was october baby or one of your first yeah was october and mm -hmm. that was a completely indie film uh back then uh how did you raise the money for that how did you you know get that off the ground it wasn't an easy film uh you know subject matter not at all. <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> why start there you know i looking back um, yeah, right. Well, you know, basically we were, you know, we, we started in as sports cameraman when I was 15. And then we, you know, like when we started, we were a service company, really found our footing doing music videos um, and commercials. Uh, and then I went to, but, you know, from the South, um, born and raised in Birmingham, Alabama, you know, obviously, our, you know, our, our, our faith has always been a huge part of our life and, and community and upbringing. And, uh, and, and then, you know, it was just around the time that all, all of this sort of new thing of faith-based films was sort of emerging uh, um, post Passion of the Christ and Sony was doing faith-based films. And, and so I went to direct second unit on a faith-based film called Courageous in Georgia. And uh, it, real Cinderella story, these, this church was making these movies and Sony was funding them and they were doing like 30 million in the box office. And, you know, they were tiny films, like one, two million dollar movies. So, um, it was amazing. And, uh, and so I went down there to, to work on those films. They wanted to do a, a, a police drama with car chases and action sequences and like churches making movies and car chases should never be combined. You know, people will die. And so I, I, I was hired to sort of go in and with professionals and take, you know, go far away from the set and do the stunt work and do the action sequences and uh, which I love. And, uh, the director of that movie asked a question that, you know, it doesn't really matter. I think what your, your beliefs are, and this is a great question to ask. He's like, you know, we're trying to understand you, like, like what's your purpose and the purpose of your work? Like, why do you do what you do? And I think a lot of us focus on what we do. Very few of us focus on why we do what we mm -hmm. do. And, uh, and I, I couldn't stop thinking about the question. Like I couldn't, the whole time I was working on that film, I, I, I was like, I couldn't stop thinking about it. And that led to sort of a fusion of a career and a calling. And, uh, the idea of, of joining the fray and jumping in on values-based, faith-based uh, uh, entertainment, uh, you know, Heartland type stuff. And uh, I remember we were doing a film with Sean Astin and he said, I see you guys as mm -hmm. frontiersmen and pioneers. And I said, thank you, Sean. That's high praise. He's like, you know, most frontiersmen die on the frontier. <laughs> and, and I'm like, well, the, 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 the name roads after us and the, and the, the, the trail will be paved. But what I learned was, it's such an it's such a privilege to be a part of anything that's emerging. You know, most industries are it's like the 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 cement to the foundation has hardened. So to be able to to make your mark on anything that's emerging right in front of you is is first of all completely out of your control. It's a factor of timing. So whether that's like technology in the seventies, you know, in, in you know computers or or even that group of directors like Spielberg and Scorsese and Lucas and Coppola and De Palma and all those guys inventing the modern blockbuster like you just have to sort of catch lightning in a bottle so it's cool to to be a part of something you know um and so that led to a completely different business to finally answer your question which is which is uh going from a service company to an intellectual properties company and starting raising money for um for you know uh our own films and uh, october baby was first we had to raise eight hundred thousand dollars to get the the production of that movie made and um and then we had to uh, raise the marketing as well. Uh, and the first quarter million, no joke, was from my grandmother, <laughs> who I kept getting to remind that she invested in film. And, uh, and then the second quarter million was from a surgeon uh, named Jim, who we had filmed like 150 of his orthopedic trauma cases. And, and so it's just, you have to be very pragmatic. You got to get really good at solving problems. Uh, and I think the thing that we didn't realize was that um, that really helped us uh, was that, you know, you really have to think holistically about a business and uh, in entertainment, we don't. So we think so much about the product and then, but we don't think about how to market and distribute the product. And so as a filmmaker, a lot of times it's like you're, you're climbing a mountain and you get to the top of the mountain and you, you know, you think that, you've summited Everest or something and actually the fog clears and there's a mountain ahead of you that's twice as tall. And, uh, and that's marketing and distribution. And so it was very, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was good fortune at the time that we couldn't get a distributor for the film and had to then go raise 
another three and a half million, which is this category of money that we that is prints and advertising it was called, called PNA to get the movie released. And then, you know, you're throwing up in a, in a trash can on Thursday night because you, you bet, you know, your, your grandmother and everyone else's <laughs> money that, you know, and uh, you know, you're thinking, you know, it's funny as a, I, you know, we make theatrical movies. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a rare part of our business that on a, on, on a Friday by about noon, you know, if the last two years of your life were, were worth anything at all, <laughs> it's like an election and I've, I've experienced all sides of it. And uh, it's a thrill, but the, but luckily the film went well and it, it cracked the top 10 and everyone made money. Thank God, including my grandmother and we made a film for Sony called uh, mom's night out. Try to, you know, I think one of the biggest things that I would recommend is just like, if you can combine two things, um, eventually you'll win. And those two things are just, I mean, maybe call it grit or just pain tolerance or endurance. Perse perseverance. If you can, perseverance, if you can combine that with curiosity, yeah. eventually you'll win. Like if you can just have a higher tolerance to pain and just keep going, like it's going to take longer than you think. But if you keep going, but you're not learning anything, then you're just going to repeat your mistakes over and over again. I've, I've, there's a lot of people like that. But if, if you have a level of tenacity, and perseverance and you match that with just being a student and learning all the time and trying to understand how things work um eventually you'll you'll catch your moment and for for me i became obsessed with the interrelated disciplines of our industry that a lot of people resent like if you're a writer and director in our industry it's like oh the marketing people or the finance people well what i learned is all these things are sort of inextricably linked you know uh the high concept and script is essential to the marketing campaign and and the movie itself and its budget is essential to the overall p l of the of the enterprise and and so what i think really helped me was the ability to think holistically and understand and just by 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 virtue of of having to um being able to look sort of and i like the name of your book the film 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 entrepreneur film, 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 film entrepreneur. entrepreneur that's such a cool term um, to try to really have the, the, the mindset of an entrepreneur uh, first and foremost, and then let your creativity funnel through that, um, I, think, I think is a much better way to be successful in our industry. Well, I mean, that's the thing that that's the reason I wrote the book is because so many filmmakers, and I've been doing this now eight years, and I've been doing my business, I've been doing the filmmaking industry for almost 30. So I've seen and, and played in so many different sandboxes over the course of my career, but I keep seeing filmmakers make the same mistakes. They just stay. They're yeah. just like they're stuck in the 90s. They think they're going to make a movie, go to Sundance, and someone is going to come down from Mount Hollywood, write them a check, and then they're making a Marvel movie. Like that's that's their idea of success. But, you know, you and I both know that that's not the reality. It doesn't happen. It, yeah, the it doesn't marketplace, happen. the marketplace isn't what it was in the 90s. A movie like Slacker yeah. could find a, could find its footing. A film like Clerks could find its footing in the 90s because there was the yeah. new VHS, the the the. the the video there was that whole so home easy. entertainment safety net, you know, yeah, so you could now, lose money at the time theatrically oh. and then pick it up in home entertainment. And the theatrical window was enough, was enough of a billboard to justify the spend, even if you lost a lot of money because home right. entertainment was so lucrative. But that was a 20, 30 year bubble, you know, um, much. and uh, and unfortunately, it's changed. The other thing that the reason you got to stay curious is we are in an industry that is rapidly changing. And, and so, it, it, you know, that's one of the, I think the problems with film schools is if you're out of the industry for four years, it's a different industry. Oh. And certainly COVID has actually accelerated that change. And so what COVID did in my contrarian point of view is that COVID's going to, COVID's going to end up reshaping our industry, very similar to how Napster reshaped music. And, mm -hmm. and what it's going to do is it just, it's going to pull forward about a decade of change into a more constricted window. And it's going to take a lot of time for the, now having said that, if you can sort of skate where the puck's going to be, as Wayne Gretzky said, there's enormous opportunities opening up, but you got to sort of let go of the past and really be hyper curious about the future. And so, uh, learning to me, being curious and learning. And I'll give you an example of what you just said. We did our second film. Our first film did 5 million. Our second did 10. was very profitable. Then we found our voice with a film called Woodlawn. We, 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 you know, they say a filmmaker finds their story and tells it over and over again. And uh, our, we found inspirational true stories. And that's just like our niche. 
spent, raised all the money for the film, raised about a third of the p a did the wrong deals. Um, didn't basically um, make as much money as we hoped. We were about 15 in box office, really needed to do 20. And that was the first time I didn't get all the money back to the investors. We had like this perfect batting average up till then with the films and the documentaries. And we really, I couldn't sleep at night. I just, I hate to lose. It's like my philosophy is like either, either we win or let's just play again. Let's just, whatever it is, ping pong, whatever, you know, go, go again. So, um, and so what we did is we actually, to me, a huge part of success is just learning to fail correctly uh, and mindfully. And failure, in my opinion, is the great teacher if you'll let it be. And so with Woodlawn, we stopped and for five months, we studied it, we asked questions, and we did something that I don't know why more people don't do. We, we solicited a ton of criticism from people like if we're going to be in an industry that has this whole category of people called critics that and we're going to read all those things obsessively why not solicit criticism from people that actually care about you and want want the best for you so we went out to all of our friends and people in the campaign outside the campaign what did we do wrong um how can we do better what what can we learn from this and it ended up with this 170 page you know post-mortem slash jerry Maguire manifesto so you know and and we saw insights to the market. We saw a new business model. And that was the playbook that led to I Can Only Imagine. And I Can Only Imagine was built to break even at 15 million box office. It did that in its first two days, first three days. Um, uh, and it did so everything between that and the 86 million in box office that it did and becoming number one independent film of the year was margin. But that would have never happened if we hadn't failed, number one, and we hadn't failed correctly, uh, number two, and really learned. We didn't make a better movie. We actually spent less on the movie with Imagine. We actually implemented a better business model um, and a much more innovative business model. And that's what led to the success of the movie. And, and we also learned a lot uh, about what people wanted. And so I would just say that you have to embrace. And what I found is the titans of our industry, Steven Spielberg, you know, we were just talking about, he is as good a businessman oh. as he is an artist and filmmaker. He's produced more films than he's directed. He is incredibly true on the business. Uh, so is Tom Hanks. And so is Matt Damon. And so has Ben Affleck. Like, like, we think of these people as artists, but they're also really astute business people. And you have to hold both um, together and you have to value both and you have to see the interrelatedness of both. Um, and I think what keeps a lot of filmmakers back is they have this sort of almost... Um, elitist resentment that we're in a business and we're selling products to people right you know and they have to right. buy them you know it's it's so, so. annoying it's a no it's just, again why i wrote the book because it was so annoying that nobody's thinking outside the box no one's thinking that this is a product no look it's art dude if you want to go make art in the backyard my friend knock yourself out but the second you take grandma's two hundred fifty thousand dollars, you better figure out a way to get grandma's money back <laughs> am mm -hmm. i i mean <laughs> it's entertainment it's not art. It's entertainment. It's a symphony of art to create it. But there's a nobility. I think it was John Laster that said the nobility of entertainment. Um, you know, the idea that, you know, we provide a service. And by the way, and I, I just believe we're in a service business. Like one of the things that we say is it's not about us. It's about the people sitting in the seats and the experience they're having. And that's it. Um, and you got to get out of the way of that. And and so to me, it's about entertaining an audience. It's about loving an audience. It's about getting, no, getting to know an audience and uh, serving that audience well. Um, and the people that have really done well in sort of other niche sectors, like um, Jason Blum has become a good friend. Oh, and, yeah. And uh, Jason's amazing. the way he thinks and the way he talks about the audience and entertaining the audience and uh, the way he places, uh, you know, um, <laughs> Jay Ellis is this friend of mine and he was one of the pilots in Top Gun. He talked about every day Tom Cruise showed up and just said, this is a privilege. What we do is a privilege. How can we exceed the expectations of the audience? So I found the really great people in our industry are much more service oriented than they are sort of selfish about their ego, about yeah, their ego. precious ego and their, their sort of artistic expression. And the greats in our industry are much more about let's entertain the audience. Like that's the noble thing to do is people are paying money. They're paying, they're, they're paying in their time. They're buying popcorn. That's more expensive than anywhere else on the earth. 
they're paying basically the same price for my movie as they are for Avatar that costs like a kajillion times more. $540 million. So, <laughs> so the attitude that I need to have is like, I'm going to do everything I can to entertain you and to uplift you and to give you a great experience in a movie theater. And then if I've done that well, maybe I can also tell you what I believe and what I hope will enrich your, your life as well. Uh, but it, it, I just, the more you apply a mindset that is not common and certainly not taught in business, uh, in, in film school, but a mindset of the pragmatism of business and a mindset of service uh, in, in entertainment, uh, the more the more you win in, in this industry. That's what I've found. And I think a lot of what the attitude that comes out of, you know, that, that's expected from filmmakers is actually opposite of what will actually get you to the top of the industry. Well, let me ask you this, because I'm really curious to hear your position on this. You know, the theatrical business model has changed dramatically since COVID. It was already on the downward slope. We were all, we all saw yeah. it. We all, and like you said, a decade worth of change has been compacted in two or three years. And the theatrical business is hurting. There's no question about it. Last time I went to a theater and I've said uh, last, last year, there was only two movies that I went to the theater that I actually went and paid money to go see, which was Top Gun and Avatar. And mm -hmm. those were the only two because those are the only two that I felt that deserved a theatrical experience from my from my point of view, for me to get out of the house and go and all that. There are other deserving movies, but you know, for me to <laughs> the kids, all that stuff, you know how it is. But your films are interesting because you are servicing an audience that doesn't get serviced often and definitely not yeah. serviced well often. So it's again goes back to that the, my book, was, which is the future of filmmaking is niche filmmaking. Finding an audience. That's good news. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Finding an audience <laughs> and serving that audience. Like you said, you want to serve them. You, you, it's a mm -hmm. privilege. So your audience is faith-based and, and specifically not only faith-based, but the subgenre of, you know, true stories that are, that's kind mm -hmm. of like where you found your, your, your really your your magic, your secret sauce, if you will. But so I, it was interesting because I just moved from L.A. to Austin and it's a very different. It's a great city. I love Austin. Love Austin. Austin. It's amazing. But I, you know, when I go to the theater or I pass by the theater, what was one of the posters I saw? Jesus Revolution. Oh, great. Yeah, we're doing an outdoor game. But, thing but that was great. but I but I saw that months ago. Months ago, I saw that in the theater. Mm -hmm. I would have probably not seen that in L.A. Probably not because it's not the demographic, quote unquote, right. of this film. This is a heartland center of the country kind of film. And but that audience shows up. They show mm -hmm. up to the theaters. They do that. So it's a lesson that I hope everyone listening is is about is one. An audience will show up for Top Gun <laughs> because it was an amazing experience. I would go see it in IMAX today. There's such an amazing experience. But if there's something that touches their emotional nerves, that's what will get people out of seats. But with that said, what do you feel about where the puck's going to be in three or four or five years? Because theaters are starting to drop more and more. Screens are just going away. I've seen them just close yeah. and shop. So how is your business model going to work differently as you might still, you probably have a longer life theatrically than most filmmakers, but at a certain point, yeah, I think it's, you know. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you, it's a great question. It's one of the questions to ask is what's the future of the theatrical experience and the theatrical window. Um, I do study it obsessively. Um, NRG has put out some really good um, reports on trends post COVID. Um, I really, I, I, the, the short, the long, the short answer is I think the theatrical window will absolutely endure, but it's just going to be different. And I think it's going to look, uh, look a lot more like Broadway, um, right. than, than, than what we had before COVID. Um, and I could literally talk your off for hours about, um, um, until like Steve Carell and crazy stupid love, you want to like roll out of a moving car. Like, Oh my gosh, I'm done with this. I'm a nerd for this stuff. But, but, um, uh, but I'll say I'll, I'll say this. Here's the question to ask for every independent filmmaker. Um, if you're asking the question, which I think traps us, is this a good movie? Therefore, it deserves a theatrical experience. That's the wrong question. Correct. The best thing that I wrote down 
that I think is way more true now that even when I wrote it in that postmortem to Woodlawn is I wrote down, this is no longer a movie business. This is a brand driven event business. And that's what it is. So Avatar is a brand. Um, you know, Top Gun's a brand and it's an event. It's a social event and we need those things and we need to go see them. The thing is we just need fewer of them and we want them to be bigger. And there's just, there's not everything post COVID coinciding with the streaming war. We don't need a lot of categories of films outside of our home. So if you can be one of the things that works outside the home, you actually make a lot more money right now. Like Avatar sitting on top of the box office, number one for, was it six weeks, seven weeks? Like that's not a good indicator <laughs> for most of the industry. That means that we're all just going to go see Avatar and Avatar is going to play forever, like a show on Broadway, like Les Mez or, right. you know, whatever. Uh, um, and Top Gun's the same way. Uh, and so what does that mean for all of us? And yeah, Blum's doing it. Megan did great, um, you know, and, and things will work, but less works. So the real, question, the real question to ask yourself with evaluating a movie for a theatrical opportunity is... Um, can I, like, I think my God lived at Samuel Goldwyn, who distributed my first film, one of the great old Titan executives in the industry said, he, he always asked, you know, is it a, is it a, is it a good movie? Not the right question. Is it a great movie for an audience? How many of them are there? And do I know how to talk to them? And so the real question is, yeah. can I make this as an event for an audience? If the answer to that is yes, then you have a theatrical shot. Okay, then you ask, how large is that audience? And do I know how to talk to them? And then you actually reverse engineer the economics to that end. And so what I've learned is I'm still alive in this business, number one, by the grace of God. But secondly, it's much more about mitigating risk and modeling a downside than it is betting for an upside. So like with Imagine, mm -hmm. we built it to break even in our, our prior film, film's box office, $15 million. Um, the film that I'm doing right now, Jesus Revolution, I feel that it's an event for our core audience. I think people are going to show up for it. I don't know. Talk to me in three weeks or whatever this film is. I might be wrong, but I really do feel like I really do feel like it's an event, and it's like a social event, and that's why we're putting it in theaters and really going for it. But it still has a very achievable break even, and so to me, it's really about reverse engineering uh, outcomes and protecting a downside, and so and and letting instead of saying what does this movie cost? That's the wrong question. Say, what's the business model of this? What do we think it could achieve? And, you know, if we don't know if it's theatrical, but it might be, well, then make it at a cost where the product is malleable and you can probably create a marketplace around it and flip it to a streamer at a profit, but still test it for theatrical. You get over a certain budget where it sort of has to go theatrical. So, um, so I think it's just about really thinking about the audience. And, 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 and I think the theatrical question will become, is this an event for the audience? If you can say with a straight face, this is an event for an audience of people that I know, um, release it in theaters. Uh, that's going to still work. If it's, not, if it's not a social event, and typically a social event that's undergirded by a brand, then uh, you're going to really struggle in today's environment releasing it in theaters. Well, I mean, the brand, I mean, you guys put it right in the title, Jesus. That's the brand. Mm -hmm. you know, arguably, what a great marketing, by the way, Jesus is people. Great, great marketing over the years. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll see. Yeah. Jesus, Jesus has done well from a He's brand well. standpoint. But, and, and but the point is, to me, you didn't you know, have, yeah. But I didn't, you didn't I mean, hide interrupt it. You. I didn't, you didn't hide it. And that's why I was so impressed about it because a lot of people would be scared. They would change it to something else. But to put the word Jesus, that Jesus is a trigger word for a lot of people. It has nothing to do with poor Jesus, but it's a trigger word for a lot of people. And you decided to put it right out there because you know who your audience is. And I, man, yeah, God, yeah. man, God bless you for that, brother. I mean, seriously, I was like, wow. Well, also, you know, what I, what I want to make are movies that I don't care who you are or what you believe. Right. I, I'm going to try to make a movie that you love. Um, but I found it's actually better. Instead of trying to make a million people love uh, like you, yep. just find the hundred people that absolutely love you and build a relationship with them and super serve them. And then let, their, let them be your voice to the masses and just trust that those people are indicative of some level of the population, you know, and there's more of them. And so with Jesus Revolution, you know, it'll be very interesting to see what happens because we don't have near as much, you know, advertising money as we did 
with American Underdog. Um, but we've taken the time to go all over the country and really connect the film to the audience and its leaders. And, 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 you know, there's, there's just a, there's a message behind the movie and it's a, I, I love the movie. It's a fun movie. It's, you make you laugh and cry. Yeah. And I think the performances are really good. It's kind of like my almost famous or some like, you know, yeah. ode to a Cameron Crowe film, you know? Oh, I could but, tell that. I could see that by the know, way. I could definitely right, see that. Right. What, what did Picasso say? Good artists copy, great artists feel Cameron Crowe ever listens to this. I'm sorry. But, but, uh, you know, but it, it sort of is in that spirit. And the cool thing I think about it is I didn't name the movie. Time Magazine named the movie. So this is a cover of Time Magazine from 1971 at a very similar time. And there was this psychedelic sort of uh, uh, Jesus on the cover. And uh, and with this 10-page spread that was so incredibly optimistic and hopeful. And it just said Jesus Revolution. And it was this sweeping hippie revival that was going on all over America. So the good news is there's a historical context. Time Magazine called it this, and we're just telling the story of that cover. And you know what's fascinating is after I watched the movie, it's not a it's not a preachy movie. It's actually, I love the trailer because it's, it's not a like, you know, if you don't believe in Jesus or you don't believe in, in, in that, you could still enjoy this film because it's just a great story of transformation of people searching for themselves and finding, you know, the divine within themselves and, and divine within mm -hmm. groups of people, opening up doors that are shut, discrimination against people just because of the way they look. Yeah. There's so many themes in this film that I absolutely loved and connected with. It's not like a beat you, beat you over the head with a Bible conversation. It is not by any stretch of the imagination. It really is a wonderful yeah. film that almost anybody can enjoy. I'm glad you said, I mean, I'm so, that's what we were trying for. And I'm so glad yeah. to hear you say that. We, um, we basically, uh, that's, that was exactly the intent. Uh, you know, I wanted to make a movie. I, I just think the narrower the focus, the wider the appeal. And that's why I think Jason Blum does that really well. He oh, does yeah. something specific really well. But I took my daughter to Megan and really enjoyed it, you know? And, uh, and so, um, you know, I, I think that, that what we're doing is, is, is we understand who we are in the audience that we serve. And we're, we're unapologetic and unafraid of, of telling stories that we love, that we hope other people are going to love too. And with this story, what's been interesting about it is because it is set in the world of the church in the seventies, but people that don't believe or have any sort of re religious affiliation at all, love and appreciate the movie because they see it as sort of a modern day allegory of loving the other. So basically, the story is this sort of square pastor dared by his daughter opens his church to this group of hippies um, that at the time weren't allowed to come to church. Like the, 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 at the time, it was like, you know, for a hippie to go to church, it was like, go home, get a job, take a bath, cut your hair, rejoin society. Now maybe you can come to church. And he just let them in. And there was this uh, uh, hippie street preacher named Lonnie Frisbee, and it was like a nitroglycerin moment, and that sparked this nationwide awakening. So there's a ton of natural humor in it because these groups yeah. of people are so different. But that theme of like opening your heart and your mind and literally your doors to a group of people that society would say you can't hang out with, that society would say is, 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 a, is a polar opposite point of view mm -hmm. than you, and actually learning to love each other. And joining together in in in, in something uh, that seems to play really strong and really rabbit, uh, relevant to to today's sort of just this this situation that we're in as a country, you know, um, no matter no matter what people believe. And so it's cool to be able to do something really specific. But that also plays as a broader sort of um, motivational allegory, you know. And you know what's what's wonderful about what you and Andy, your brother, do with your films is that you have this beautiful balancing act that you do with all of your films that you put just enough in to serve the core audience. But you put just enough in that someone outside of your core audience could enjoy it. Like I can only imagine. Mm -hmm. It was you, you, man, you nailed it right down the middle for your core audience. But when you're watching it, anyone can enjoy that film. Anyone can enjoy American Underdog. Like, it, you don't have to. I'm you know, glad to hear, I'm glad to hear you say that. that's the goal. I mean, a lot of times it's like it's fun to be able to test contrarian opinions, like like opinions that maybe other people don't share. And and uh, my opinion about Christianity is it's not divisive. Um, it's not. Uh, you know, uh, there's this verse in the Bible that says the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. 
And then it says, against these things, there is no law. And my opinion is when you portray those things correctly, like who's going to say we don't need more love, joy, peace, and patience and kindness with each other and goodness in society? Like, mm -hmm. like uh, we, we need these things today. And I think if you just let the story do the work, you know, trust the audience's, um, you know, uh, abilities, and you don't have to beat them over the head. And, and, and I think that just choose stories that you feel are powerful and life changing and tell them to the best of your ability. I think that that's just a better way to do it. And I think if you do it right, these stories can be inviting and inspiring, no matter what belief you have. And I don't think anyone should ever feel alienated or driven away or ostracized by Christianity. I just think that that's, that's unfortunate. And one of the things that I would hope changes, you know, over the next decade is this is, this is just, this is good stuff for everybody. And, and those are the stories that we want to tell. And I think when you just really portray and infuse the, the virtues of Christianity in ways that are really entertaining and stories, you know, th there are things that are universally needed and, uh, and, and things that we, we, who doesn't love a good redemption story? You know, I mean, absolutely. And I mean, it's very progressive what you're saying. You know, and it, it shouldn't be, but it is, uh, and, and yeah. in a wonderful in a wonderful way because your point of view on your faith is not, you know, and, and this is a weird thing because I lived in the bubble of Los Angeles for thirteen years, and then when mm -hmm. I moved to Austin, I just saw things a little bit differently. It's really interesting to see. And by the way, yeah. Austin, not the the most conservative situation <laughs> in Texas. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. To the imagination. It, this, well, this is know, where, this is all the crazies and all the weirdos. And, you know, keep Austin it's weird. A and, city, though. and it's a yeah. wonderful city. But you, I just start seeing things a little bit differently on the way. I'm like, oh, okay, this makes sense now. And it, it's, I love this. I love what you guys are trying to do because you are trying to bring the two, the two sides, whatever those the sides, two sides are, together, together yeah. because that's what we should be doing. Regardless, you know, you and I both grew up at a time where we both could you know, believe different things and still have a beer or still have a conversation. Absolutely. Or watch like, you know, like, yeah. like, are you kidding me? My, my father and me have completely different points of view on life, you know, and uncles and, you know, all that kind of stuff in the family. But, you know, we still get together. We still love each other. We still, you know, that's right. We might, and that's we might what's have needed. You know, it's, it sounds like such a cliche, but yeah. Uh, Love really is the answer, you know, in, in the sense of like, it, you know, when you think of like, uh, 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 you know, there is so much more that unifies us um, and things to agree on and, and then, then divides us. And I think there's just this gap of fear in the middle. Yeah. And, uh, and I, for me, you know, I had the good fortune of being born and raised in like the, the, the buckle of the Bible belt. Birmingham, Alabama, but very quickly at the age of 15, traveling outside of it because I was working for ESPN. And then in marketing the films, you know, I, I live in Nashville, Tennessee. I commute to and work in Los Angeles. Uh, I spend about half the week or, or a week of the month or whatever there. Um, we market these films everywhere. Uh, I have traveled the continental United States, man. And you just realize that there's a lot that binds us together and there's a lot to have a beer over and talk about and celebrate. And when you just boil things down to their themes and their values, there is a lot of values that we agree on. And so I think as a, as a Christian, what I've realized is, man, actually, there's a hunger for this stuff beyond belief, you know, in, oh. in terms of like beyond what people believe. I think if you sit down and watch some things that are really well made, um, but, but, you know, so, so we, we had a decade of the antihero, very good versions of that. Um, but if you binge Game of Thrones, House of Cards, Breaking Bad, you just, it's hard to believe in anything, let alone yourself. And I think people are craving a sense of meaning and purpose and, uh, and values. And uh, so there's sort of a return. So yeah, has Christianity been weaponized and counterfeit? Absolutely. Um, but that's just what we do as people, whether it's politics or religion or whatever. All, all religions, by the way, almost all religions. Yeah. But I would say that, you know, it says something about the source because you only ever really weaponize something that's intrinsically powerful and you only counterfeit something that's intrinsically valuable. So of course the crazies are going to use this thing to their own, you know, purposes and there's going to be televangelists and there's going to be rogue people. But, but I think the thing at its source is, is beautiful and meaningful and powerful. And whether you believe it to be 
absolutely true. Like I, like I do. Um, and I find great meaning from that. Or whether you're like Thomas Jefferson, who famously cut all of the references to the divinity of Christ out of a Bible. It's called the Thomas Jefferson Bible. The reason he did that is he said he didn't really believe in the, the, the divinity or questioned it, but he thought the teachings of Jesus were the greatest moral reset in the history of the world, you know, and I agree with him. And so what it's just good stuff. It's, you know, loving your neighbor, going the extra mile, turning, turning the cheek, uh, you know, uh, being known by how you love people. Like these are things that if we reintroduce to society, society would be better for it. And, and I think that the best way to do that is through stories. And so what we want to do is we want to tell stories that, that certainly, um, resonate with our core audience with that heartland audience and super serve them uh but also are just um hopefully uh entertaining and applicable uh to to whoever wonders in the theater but what we want to do first and foremost is entertain we're, we're entertainers first and i hope to, there is nothing like being in an audience of people and hearing them laugh and cry uh and cheer at a, at a movie and i've never seen a movie like jesus revolution we've really screened it far and wide and early landscape let us we've shown it to a lot of people and uh you know i've not ever been a part of a movie where people are cheering during the film uh at, at certain points and uh that's a wonderful experience and it's so it's wonderful to connect with a core audience like that you know it's it's in it, it, what you're saying is true because i've noticed that as well in some of the other work that i do and other shows that i do that people are starving for this kind of message these positive messages these positive stories these things that are that fill you up and look i love breaking bad i thought breaking bad was one of the greatest amazing it's the last the, the most perfect last hours of television ever ever made. ever made no ever. Ever. and other than maybe two episodes of the entire series except like that fly episode drove me nuts uh other than that the whole series was almost perfection it really was it as, as 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 as, uh, as an art as as an mm -hmm. art piece it was beautiful but at the end, you don't feel really uplifted by by what Walter White has been doing. You know, it's been entertaining as hell. But then you watch something like Shawshank, which is one of my favorite films of all time. And that's it, right. That's exactly the difference. Yeah. And then you and you look at Shawshank, and and if you look at IMDb, it overtook The Godfather as the most as the best film ever made. How and why? And I've I've said this, and I've talked to Oscar winning screenwriters about this. I've talked to every story analyst about this. I've talked to filmmakers about this. I'm like, what is it about that film that's connected with so many people from every walk of life since its release? And it's the worst name in film history, worst name in film history. On, <laughs> on, on paper, it is not a particularly great story. You know, it's like, oh, it's a it's it's a it's a prison movie. It's a movie. tough story. It's a tough it's, story, too. Yeah. Right. It's it's not a it's not a particularly like innovative story on the surface but what frank darabont was able to do with that movie has connected so deeply with people who you know people who think steven seagal's the greatest actor of all time love shawshank <laughs> yeah no it transcends man and i'll tell yeah. you what it is at its essence um uh you know i love to i love to think about and find the essence of things there's this great book um Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. This guy this was in several, um, you know, uh, uh, he survived the Holocaust. His family didn't. And a psychologist um, was in several camps, came out and finished the work that he beat and began before, uh, which led to, to one of the great psychology books ever written, which is Man's Search for Meaning. And, and uh, he had this incredible optimism, even though of all he'd been through. And his take was that he came up with this thing, logotherapy, is the Greek word for me or logotherapy. I don't know how to say it. It's the Greek word for meaning. And his point was that actually pleasure wasn't sort of the end all like Freud, you know, he, his point was that actually the, the quest is to find a sense of meaning and purpose to your life. That is what everyone's looking for. So if you talk about the function of a storyteller, whether that's a movie or a play or sitting around a campfire, the function of a storyteller in society is to try to take all this nonsense and all these things that don't connect and, you know, and fit them together to bring a sense of order and meaning and purpose. So the stories that I think transcend, you know, when, when uh, Raina Wallace writes that line, 
every man dies, not every man really lives in the middle of a brilliant film, Braveheart. But that's meaning and purpose. And I think it's actually the power of that theme that makes that movie transcend, not its genre. Um, I think it's the theme of living from your heart and living from your soul, you know, and living from your passion. And Shawshank's the same way. Hard movie, but brilliant material in terms of meaning and purpose. And so I think when we did I Can Only Imagine, yeah. I took Bart aside and just says, what is the essence of like, what do people, how does this a dude that looks like you, no offense, write this multi-platinum juggernaut, independent artist, not you, I'm talking about Bart. Uh, yeah. You look great. Uh, anyway, so, so uh, and so does Bart now. But anyway, uh, but the idea of, you know, how does, how does, uh, you know, just, he's just an everyman, you know what I'm saying? Like there's right. nothing, you know, uh, and, and he was an everyman with an everyman band that was, you know, independent from Texas. How do you write this multi-platinum juggernaut? I just said, what do people feel when they hear the song? And because uh, I got to match that with the movie, whether people know it or not, they're going to want to feel the same way. And uh, he said, you know, it's a rush of hope. That's what they feel. And so we sort of we sort of engineered the whole movie around that same experience. And I just feel like people need a rush of hope right now. They need a sense of like, my life matters there's meaning to life. There's some sort of destiny. There's some sort of purpose here. Uh, and, and, and I, and I, and, and I need sort of, I, I need to go out of a theater feeling hopeful and feeling like I matter and, and life is worth living. And I think that as great as Breaking Bad is, as great as Game of Thrones is, except for the last season, please remake it. Um, you know, <laughs> you know, the, you, you, you have the opposite after you watch those things, you just sort of feel this sense of it's me versus everyone else hopelessness, you know, and it's survival at all costs. And I think that's seeped into our society a little bit. And I honestly think that the aggregate entertainment is one of the reasons why we're at each other's throats, you know, um, because if you watch Game of Thrones and House of Cards, Breaking Bad and all those other things, it's like, okay, there's one law. I got to live and you got to die and that's it. You know, it's me versus everybody. And I think that's gotten into society a little bit. And I actually think, you know, what we say is the world needs a little more Capra in it. You know, sense of Frank Capra, you know, it's a yeah. wonderful life and, and, and things like that. A little, little optimism, a little hope. And, uh, and I think that there's room in the market for it. Do you think that, because uh, I think there's going to come a point, I, I do think there's going to come a point in the next decade that there's going to be a runaway hit, like a juggernaut hit. And it's not going to be one. There's going to be a series of them that are, and you guys are probably going to be behind one or two of them at least. Who knows? Uh, Who knows? But they're, that's going to connect with the majority of people looking for that rush of hope. And they're going to go, oh, wait a minute. Maybe we shouldn't remake another Star Wars or another Marvel show. And maybe we should start putting some money into this. Do you think yeah. that will ever happen within the studio? Because they always go where the money goes, even after passion. I think of the everything is cyclical. I think everything is cyclical and everything is counter programming. And I think one of the reasons I can only imagine worked was um, there was an article before it came out that Deadline wrote that said, like, the music biopic is dead. Like, these films don't work anymore. <laughs> the point is, we sort of were at the front end of, of the reemergence of a dormant genre. Now you think like Elvis and the star is born and, you know, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody and all these music, like one right after the other, this is now a reestablished genre. So it's actually a little more risky. One of the real hard things about um, filmmaking is an independent filmmaking, especially is that the way to win with independent film is our minds are differential engines, meaning there's a great marketing book, Seth Godin's book, Purple Cow, yeah, where yeah. his whole thesis is that if you see a cow, you don't take a photo of a cow. You don't tweet a cow. You've seen a cow. They're all cows. They all look the same. But my gosh, if that cow was purple, you know, oh my gosh, there's a purple cow. Um, you know, so I'm going to tweet that. You know, so my point is that you really have to have the courage and conviction that if something is entertaining and meaningful to you, it'll be entertaining and meaningful to other people. Like there's more of you. And I remember what I can only imagine, we had done all this research and we had seen a gap in the market and then we had seen the, the need for a brand. And, and I knew that I, I love that song and everybody I knew loved oh. that song. Yeah. And so in, in the core community, 
But every studio told us no. One executive in the studio said, you know, you know, I think there's 18,000 people that would watch this movie. And that's that's it. That's the total audience. This will never work. But <laughs> we just went forward with a conviction. But because we went forward with a conviction, we owned it because nobody would uh, um, nobody would take a risk on it. And, and, we, and we benefited from that. And so I think you have to be willing to be different, you know, uh, um, and you have to be willing to um, to take it, take bets on things that you feel deeply. And, uh, you know, I think when you listen to the stories of like star Wars or jaws or uh, one of the great, one of the great blocks of our industry in that three hour, um, empire of dreams documentary is the, oh. the chairman of 20th century Fox came to Alan Ladd jr. Who was the, who was the, uh, chairman of the motion picture group and said it was in post-production said shut down this star war this star wars thing it's an embarrassment to the studio and alan ladd jr not having seen a frame of the film said i've seen it it's the greatest movie ever made it's one of the greatest bluffs in the history of our industry but the point is that's how weird star wars was to to everyone that that was looking at it you know and they were the studio was sending notes like the the wookie should have pants why does the wookie not have like stupid like <laughs> really that, the point is that the studio business is a rear view business and they only, the thing is like, Hey, we, we want something totally original. That's just like something else that made a billion dollars last year. Like that's just the way they think. And so it takes a level of conviction and, and it takes a level of, as an independent filmmaker, extraordinary belief. Um, and, th and I actually think a lot of independent filmmakers have like, they want to stay above that. Like, well, I got work on this thing and you know, it's going to be good. You actually have to have an attitude of like, I love this. I know there's people that love this. I'm trying to make it the best I can, but I'm telling you there's an audience for this. And you have to have a level of conviction in yourself and in the thing that you're creating that is uncommon to will it through the system and to get money for it and then to will right. it into existence. And that, and that's, I think, missing a lot in independent film. You know? And I think the one thing that we can kind of summarize from this conversation is as independent filmmakers, you need to not just make a movie that tickles your own fancy. It has to do a little bit of that, but you have to find out if there's an audience for it and don't say horror movies. A lot of people like horror movies. That's not, that's too big, which is again, going back to my book. I, it's about niching down and niching down to the point mm -hmm. where like, what is an audience that will enjoy this movie and I can talk to, which is what you're with that, what that executive said, can you reach that audience? with the money and the resources and the abilities that you have. And if you can combine those two, then you have a, a potential, not a guarantee, a potential for success. But the biggest thing is like, yeah. oh, I'm going to make an action movie because people like action movies. You're done. You're done. Well, you know, what's interesting about that is I think one of the, one of the real uh, secrets to that, if you want to know like a key that sort of unlocks it, it's summarized in the word disdain. And what I mean by that, that's what I really bonded with Jason Blom over was the, any audience that feels disdain, right? Um, he felt like 20 years ago, the horror audience felt disdain. Like studios were like, they don't care. Like just murder a bunch of people. It doesn't have to be good. And the audience felt that. And, um, you know, I've learned in therapy, <laughs> I should do it a little more. You know, the primary <laughs> needs of people are to not to be agreed with. You have to agree with them. People just want to feel seen and heard and understood. And, and you know, identifying oh people like horror movies is like well now it's like well no yeah they like horror movies and guess who saw that before no one else did jason blum and now he's dominated and monopolized the market so you have like a one in one thousandth chance of competing with him um what you really have to see and have the courage to 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 embrace is is an underserved audience um that 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 is being disdained by the industry and you have to be willing to understand that instead of trying to be cool at cocktail parties in LA, <laughs> you know what makes you cool at cocktail parties in LA? Winning. So go win with an audience and then, you know, and focus on just loving an audience. And so for me, the faith audience is one of those groups that, you know, they're being called things like, again, it's not a political affiliation, but it's seen that way in LA. And so they're being called things like deplorable. And so, and there's also this stigma of poor quality. I remember talking to an investor 
His mm-hmm. daughter was there. And I said, you want to know the, you want to know the opportunity and the problem in faith. It's the same thing. He said, sure. I turned to his daughter and said, let's play rapid word association game. I'm just going to say something, just respond. She said, okay. And I said, Christian movies. And she goes, ew. And I'm like, in one syllable, she just described the problem and the opportunity. Like if you fix that. So for a lot of people, they don't want to be associated with it. I would rather go right at it. Like Jason Blum went right at it with horror and say, okay, we hear you. We hear that there's a quality problem and it's also a lack of authenticity and you're underserved and you're disdained by whatever you're getting. We're going to, we're going to fix that on your behalf. That's the business opportunity. So you really, you know, whether that's crunchy roll, think about it. Um, VIX plus is just having huge growth right now. Uh, um, or, or, or Blum doing something specific or Mr. Beast, Mr. Beast on YouTube. Yeah. It's exactly getting to know, developing a relationship, nurturing a relationship with an audience that's underserved, um, that no one else sees value in yet that no, or no one has the courage to really give them what they want. Um, or an audience that you understand and are representing in a unique way, like a movie, like crazy rich Asians or whatever, having the courage to do that instead of like, have the courage to be unique. Conformity is not the way forward in our industry. Everyone in LA looks the same, has the same spec script in their back pocket, you know, wants to talk about themselves, you know, and so homo- it's, it's homogenized. And so to yep. me, the courage to be different is, is the way forward. And the people like Tyler Perry or Jason or people that yeah. I've you know, interacted with, they have way more success by differentiating and, and the narrower the focus is, the wider the appeal. And so it's just have the courage and, and conviction to do something that you really believe in, that you want and need, and that you're connected to an audience that wants, wants and needs and be willing to be unpopular while you do it because you'll be popular when it works. And, and, uh, <laughs> and that's just a different, a different way to think and a different way forward. But if you, if you identify, if you're just in the rearview mirror and like, you know, oh, the audience, what action films work. Yeah. And everyone knows that. And that's why it's at saturation. That's impossible. <laughs> you have to be the one that says, hey, this will work. And everyone says, you're crazy and weird for years for until everyone. all of a sudden all you're not. Them. All of them. Cameron. That's, that's how you, you know, right? Titanic, that's what you Titanic, have to do. Titanic. Horrible idea. Avatar. Horrible idea. <laughs> right? Titanic. That's what they all said. If you listen to Peter them. Churning, Titanic, most expensive movie. At the time. Yeah. On top of the most expensive movie. It was $110 million, most expensive movie at the time. And he went $110 million over budget. Yeah. So, you know, the For a story that we knew endure, the ending. For a story that we right? knew the ending of. <laughs> so, so to me, just, I think, um, look, if I can leave you with anything, is do things that you really believe in and just match perseverance with curiosity. And then also a level of courage in your decisions. You know, I would rather fail courageously Mm-hmm. Then fail because I made a safe choice, you know, and and do something that you really believe in and have the courage to be different and have the courage to put a different voice out there. Because I think that that's what people want is, is unique voices that represent unique audiences. Um, uh, that's one of the joys of the film world is you get to start to see things through, through someone else's eyes. And so, uh, and so that's what I'll, what I'll leave. Otherwise, the biggest thing is just to keep learning constantly and never, ever, ever quit. <laughs> you know? Success might be just around the corner. You never know. So, John, I'll ask you a few questions to ask all my guests. Uh, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Oh, my gosh. What a question. <laughs> I'm horrible at answering questions. Uh, um, you know, well, um. Uh, you know, I would I would actually say the value of failure. I think. Yeah. I think that's what people don't under failure is mm-hmm. incredibly valuable, and it's really the only path to success. And I think it's something that we all run from. But if we actually ran towards it and learn to sort of fail small and iterate, you know, I mean, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Yes, yeah, some things do kill you though. You want to avoid those things, but if you can sort of fail and learn. It's like Thomas Edison said, I've not failed. I've just learned 10,000 ways not to make the light bulb. Um, if you embrace failure as a part of your process, um, I think that that's the way to win. And it take, took me a long time to, to it, it's a very vulnerable thing to be willing to fail so that you can learn how to win. And, uh, and I think that took me the longest to learn. And the toughest question of all three of your favorite films of all time. Three of my favorite films of all time. I, I have this list of sort of 
films that I just think no for, for first of all, there's no perfect film. Uh, um, I think George Lucas said it best: films are never complete; they're only abandoned. Uh, but but there are films that I think for for the moment in time in which they were created are untouchable. Like don't change a frame. Uh, so I think I'm trying to think of some of those. Um, and then there's also just great films that 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 I've seen, you know, recently. But to me, Braveheart is still just like oh. chicken soup for my soul. I just think that that's <laughs> such a well-made film that I just it just gets me, man. It just gets me uh, every time. Uh, it's good, good so filmmaker. good. You know, I still think um, Saving Private Ryan is is one of those things when he says earn this at the end. I'm just. It, that's a summary of an entire generation and uh and and just incredible um you know i think i think the king's speech is amazing i think uh, gosh i'm beyond three slumdog millionaire fellowship of the ring was just one of the transcendent experiences i had in the theater like oh my gosh uh um and then i think some of the old ones i, I think uh um it's a wonderful life and um uh, you know, uh, uh, Casablanca, you know, I think it's a gotcha. darn perfect movie. Um, I've exceeded my limitations. Well, I mean, I'd, I'd argue. What's that, your answer to that question? I mean, well, Shawshank is a perfect movie in my opinion. I mean, Shawshank is, Shawshank is, is perfect. It, it's a perfect, yeah. I think back to the future is perfect. The, it's one of the greatest scripts ever made. It kind of is, isn't it? It is. It's the, it is as perfect of a screenplay and perfect of an and execution. By the way, produced by. Steven Spielberg. Steven Spielberg and Zemeckis and also, said, "There's no better, there's no better producer and, than a director." You know? And everyone said he was. He, everyone said they were crazy, and it was only Steven that was able to push it through. And then they stopped two weeks after shooting with the wrong guy. Like, yeah, we're gonna redo these last. Can you imagine? Can you imagine Welcome to the me? film business. I mean, and Welcome Jaws. Jaws business. is another perfect film. I mean, you that that movie doesn't. It, it just it is perfect. Jaws is Jaws it's, is is one of those things where the limitations. The, lim the limitations are what made it perfect uh yeah. for sure i think um look i would put top gun maverick up there as one man. of the best experiences i've had in a theater in a oh. long long time man i can't really even, I, really good man it is such a good good movie and 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 it's yeah there's nostalgia with that film uh without question for guys like you and me but it is just damn near perfect in what it was yeah. it, it aimed to do uh without question and i, I mean i I'd also put up the matrix as almost as a perfect movie as well the matrix is a po is one of the again it's it's as perfect as a movie gets by far i think probably the filmmaker that i most trust now and i can't wait for indiana jones is james mangle i think that dude just fires he nails, all he nails cylinders it. every time like i thought ford versus ferrari unbelievable Amazing. um well, well, you know logan uh, logan i mean logan, logan he transcended he transcended the genre on, and that, again logan's one of those where it it transcends you know it's hyper violent it's gritty but that quest for meaning and purpose and transcendence is all um uh right there and then television i just think uh I, I'm one of those. I, I know everyone's on it, but I think The Last of yes. Us is great. I just think it's really. I hear. Great. I hear that's good, but for me, Yellowstone right now is is any anything that Taylor. See, does. I haven't taken the Yellowstone trip. Like I haven't. Dude, totally, you gotta take like the Yellowstone. On, it's on Some my of the list. Best writing I've ever seen on television. It's so good. It's and then so I think good. anything Vince. I think anything Vince Gilligan does is just like he, he's such a oh, student of so our good. industry and our craft so that just comes. He's like Tarantino in in that way. He just it comes out. His love and obsession of the of the craft uh, comes out. So John, yeah, John, lots of good it, movies, man. When can and when and where can we see Jesus Revolution? Jesus Revolution comes out nationwide February twenty fourth. It's in theaters everywhere. And uh, thank you, Cameron Crowe, for all the things that I stole. And I uh, hope you enjoy it <laughs> the very same way. And uh, and I think I think no matter what you believe, you'll really enjoy it. It's, it's an enjoyable film. And uh, and and go check it out in theaters. John, I could talk to you for hours, brother. I appreciate you coming on, man. This is you, fun, you, man. Likewise, you, you and your brother have to you come when you come down to Austin. We gotta go grab a beer, man. Uh, without question. I love it. I'm there. I'm there pretty frequently. So let's do it. I appreciate. I you, love brother. it. Thanks for watching. Click on one of the videos below to continue your journey and don't forget to subscribe.